So we handled this in a multiplicative way. When I say we handled this, this referring to that right there. So we could deal with this in an additive way. And the way we could deal with an additive way, which I recommend go the multiplicative route, your life will be a little easier. So we basically factored out 1 third squared and uh, was a ninth, and then got 1 ninth of that sum. So let's instead of going multiplicative route, we can go an additive route. What am I talking about? So separately, sum 1 third to the k power k equals 0 to infinity is 1 plus 1 third plus 1 ninth plus 1 over 27 plus dot dot dot. Alright, so that is 1 third to the k power from k equals 0 to infinity. How is this series different than the actual one that we got from the example problem? Yeah, it has the first two terms as two extra terms that we don't have in our original series. So what I'm going to do is solve for the original series. So I'm going to solve for this right here. And I see it right here. So how do I solve for that? It's pretty easy. I'm going to subtract 1, subtract 1 third. So that's not very hard to do. I don't need to write down more than two terms because I know what the pattern is. And then over here, we're going to get a minus 1 minus 1 third plus the summation k equals 0 to infinity, 1 third to the k power. So any questions about what I'm doing? So the last thing we know what the sum is right here, it's 1 over 1 minus r. And r is 1 third. Minus 1 minus a third is minus 4 thirds. And let's go ahead and make this a less ugly number. So 1 minus a third is 2 thirds. Negative 2 thirds reciprocal is negative 3 halves. Minus 4 thirds. Oh man, common denominator, that's not very fun. This is it 6? We have negative 8 minus Oh, it's positive 3 halves. What am I doing? 1 minus a third is positive 2 thirds, which is 3 halves. Plus 9 is 1 sixth. All right, so that's an additive way to deal with the same situation, not starting at the right uh, value. So I recommend go the multiplicative route. Here's the way to go the additive route. And it's up to you which way you go. All right, next problem. Find the sum of negative 20 plus 5 minus 5 fourths plus 5 sixteenths minus dot dot dot. So we saw this before. This basically, it's easier to see the pattern going from 5 to negative 5 fourths to positive 5 sixteenths, which is fourth squared. So multiply by a fourth every time you go over, negative 1 fourth. So we'll see the negative one-fourth pattern right here. And I think we just multiply by negative 20. Should give us what we want. Is that right? So it looks like it gets to the same series right there. So go ahead and use the formula. <coughs> Well, first of all, what can I do with this negative 20 here? Yeah, use my favorite F word. 
Yes. So we're going to factor that out. Negative 20. Summation k equals 0 to infinity. All right, so use that formula and tell me what the number that this adds up to. on negative 16. So intuitively, why would it be negative 16? If you just look, it starts at negative 20, and then you add a smaller positive number, subtract an even smaller negative number, add an even smaller positive number. So the con contributions are going to become smaller and smaller. So the further down you go, the less it's going to change. And that idea is basically what it means to be convergent. So you're modifying that some, some value by a smaller and smaller amount. You have to be careful. We'll see some examples where adding a smaller amount does not mean you converge. And we will see that pretty soon. One of the, uh, the classic examples is called the harmonic series, which is uh, 1 over k. So we'll look at that. We've basically, that uh, graphs out like the, uh, where the natural log function comes from. So we'll do one more, two more examples here. So I believe this is like a homework problem. So we're going to drop a ball h meters above the ground. It rebounds r times h meters. is between 0 and 1. Obviously, unless you have some ball that bounces higher than where you dropped it from. I think there was a movie about that. But generally, that doesn't happen. So depending on what type of material the ball is made of, it will bounce up a different portion of the uh, height that it was dropped from. So if you have a really good bouncy ball, it bounces almost up to where you dropped it from. So we want to see, find the total distance traveled. Now I believe this problem is set up, I'm not a physics expert, but I believe it is set up this way to model no wind resistance. So this uh, R corresponds to the bounciness of the ball, some type of static elastic type collision if you've taken physics class. But this does not account for a wind resistance or air resistance. So the ball does not, it only is affected by gravity and then it bounces some portion of, uh, maintains some amount of the uh, energy that it had. So we want to find total distance traveled. I'm saying this because in this problem the ball will bounce forever, which is not realistic. It will slow down from friction and eventually come to a rest. So let's go ahead and draw what this looks like. So we're going to start at a height of h, whatever that is. So we're starting here. And we're going to, time is going to be the x-axis. 
So it hits the ground and then it will bounce up, but it doesn't bounce back to uh, H, it bounces up to RH. So R is less than one, so some, let's just pretend it's somewhere close to three fourths is where I graphed it. So it's gonna bounce back up to there and then back down and bounce up again. What is the height on the second time it bounces up? What is the maximum height? R times R times H. Yep, R times R times H. So it was at height RH and it will bounce up to R times the height it came from. So the second bounce is gonna be R times R times H. So I'm gonna write it as R squared H. And again, bounces again, and it's gonna be R cubed H, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll just write dot, dot, dot. So this problem it will bounce forever. Now, this intuition doesn't work because it will bounce forever yet only go a finite uh, distance. So intuitively, it's very hard to think about something that will go forever and also not go an infinite distance. But it's because it will bounce and eventually it will be bouncing such a small amount that it will contribute almost nothing. So let's go ahead and model the amount it's bouncing. So let's go by bounce. You have to be careful because the very first bounce is really a half bounce. So we only get half of a distance on the first one and then all the other ones are regular. So let's go and compute the first one by itself, and then we'll get all the rest. So how much, the total distance, how much distance did it travel on the first downward bounce? Just H, that's it. So we got first bounce. Distance equals H. Now I could write second bounce distance. So I'm gonna partition this off so I don't, it's not gonna follow the pattern here. Actually, let's call this the zero bounce. That'll be better. And then this will be the first bounce. So the zero bounce distance is H. It seems like zero should have a TH after it. The zeroth? Yeah, definitely. As opposed to the zero and that's hard to say. So first bounce, how much distance are we gonna travel on the first bounce? So sort of RH, but then we're gonna go back down. So we go RH on RH. So we go to RH. So that'll be our first bounce. So I'll just put a one right there. Uh, second bounce. What is our second bounce distance? So it'll be two r squared h. And I could write the third bounce, but I think I would just be insulting your intelligence. So let's write the nth bounce. So dot, dot, dot. The nth bounce. What is the distance on the nth bounce? Yes, that is exactly right. So it will be r times r times r, n times 2r to the n h. It's a good time to make sure your n's don't look like your h's. So we got 2r to the n h. So how do we get the total distance? We just add all these together. And that's all we need to do. So total distance will go d equals, so I'm going to separately do h plus summation k equals, where does this sum start? This one, first one is r to the first power, not r to the zero power. So I'm gonna start k equals one to infinity two r to the kh, like that.
So this is the height on the kth bounce, and we're going from, we started counting at one, and going to infinity. So any questions on that summation setup? So let's do some factoring now. What can I factor out? Get the two out, get the h out. Why can I not factor the r to the k out? Not constant. Not constant because of what variable? What's the actual variable? K. So there's two letters, but the one that's changing is the one that appears down there. So just like a dx integral, anything that's got an x in it, you can't bring outside. This is sort of like that, but our variable here is k. So you can't bring any k stuff outside. But I can definitely get to 2h out. So we have h plus 2h, summation k equals 1 to infinity, r to the k. This is almost perfect. Why is it not quite ready for the summation formula that we have? Starts at 1. So how do we deal with that? Two ways to do it. What are the two ways? So we could do a additive solution, so we could subtract the first term out, or we could go multiplicative, and I will start back at zero, and then compensate by adding one to k. So let's do the multiplicative, because it's a little faster usually. So we have h plus 2h summation k equals zero to infinity r to the k plus one. So we dropped k by 1, and then we compensated by adding. And now we're just going to factor one of these uh, r's out, but I'll do that very carefully. So some easy algebra. r to the k plus 1 is r times r to the k. So that's easy algebra. So why am I allowed to bring the r to factor the r out? It's got no k in there. So r is some number that was predetermined at whenever the ball was manufactured, and that's the r that we're going to be using here. So the r is not going to change. So we have h plus 2hr, summation r to the k, k equals 0 to infinity. And now everything is set up perfectly for that summation formula. And the good news is, if you don't know what r is, you don't have to simplify. So you can just leave your answer like this. You don't have to go figure out what number is 1 minus r. So I don't know what r is, so I'm going to leave it like this. And that is our final answer right there. I didn't even talk about units, did I? Meters. So this would be in meters. So this example is going to be different than all the others. All the others were geometric series. This is not a geometric series. So this is definitely not a geometric series. There's nothing taken to the k power. So I can't use that geometric series formula that is up near the top. So that's going to be useless. What other way did I talk about being able to find a sum? That could be useful. Let's see. So is it right up at the top? So we could, if we could get a nice partial sum, we could figure out the full sum by taking a limit. So let's go and try to get a partial sum here. So 
So we're going, so it's not geometric. So we're going to try partial sum. So let's start with S1. What is S1? That's 1 over 1 times 2, which is 1 half. S2, 1 over 2 times 3 is 1 sixth. S4, 1 over 3 times 4 is 1 twelfth. 4 times 5, 1 twentieth. I can keep going. S6 and impress you with multiplication skills. 5 times 6, 1 thirtieth. I don't really see a good way to add these together. Oh, these are not partial sums. These are the terms. I have to add them together to get partial sums. So that is the first term, 1 6 plus 1 half. Ooh, 4, 4 6. So we get 1 12th plus what came before, which is 4 6. What's that? Oh. Oh, thank goodness. That's a far less painful error. Two, three, four. All right. So S1, there's only one term. S2 has two terms. It's got the, uh, S, the first term plus the two term right here. And then the next sum is the previous, this one, plus the very next term. So it's a 1 12th is the next term plus that 4 6 you had from before. And two, this is 6 twelfths. Ah, 9 twelfths. All right. 1 20th plus 9 twelfths is not a very fun number. I don't know. What's that? 60. 60. Come on, we can do this. 60. So we got 3. 48. Yeah. 48. Oh, man. Oh, this one's easy. 48 60ths. So that's 50 60ths. All right, still not the easiest pattern to see. Maybe we may be able to see a pattern if we worked really hard. We're going to go a slightly different route. Remember partial fractions? So that's an algebra move. So let's do partial fractions right here. So what do your denominators look like? It's going to be a over k plus b over k plus 1. So let's do partial fractions really quickly. 1 equals a k plus 1 plus b k. What's a good k value? Negative 1 is good. What's another one? 0. Zero. And we'll be done right there. So we'll let k equal 0 and we'll get 1 equals a plus 0, so a equals 1, and let k equal negative 1, and we get 1 equals 0 plus b times negative 1, so b is negative 1. So I have 1 over k minus 1 over k plus 1. So that's pretty easy partial fractions. Nice, super, super fast review right there. So let's go ahead and rewrite our summation with 1 over k minus 1 over k plus 1. So we're going to rewrite 
the series. Let's just go ahead and write out these terms here. So I'm just going to start writing terms until we see a pattern. So when k is 1, we have 1 over 1 minus 1 over 2. So that is the first term. So I want you to write out the next three terms. You'll probably see the pattern before you finish writing a third term. So what's happening in this series? Yep, a lot of terms are canceling out. So this is the full sum right here. So we just look, things are gonna start canceling. So if I write Sn, the partial sum, so this is the full sum, we'll call it S. Uh, so partial sum is gonna be one over one minus one over I think it will be big N plus one. So it'll be first term minus the second part of the last term. So if K was four, I stopped at K equals four, and my last part was minus one over one fifth. So that would have been one over K plus one. So our nth sum will be one minus one over N plus one. And S equals lim big N approaches infinity of Sn. So I'm just going to take this limit, super easy limit to take. So the first part doesn't have any ends in it, so it's just 1 minus 1 over infinity, which we know as 0. So our sum for this will be 1. And this type of series is called telescoping. I believe it's called telescoping. The old like pocket telescope that pops out. I think some antennas are like that where it kind of slides into itself and that's the type of thing where terms sort of eat the one that came part of the one that came before so you really just have a first and a last term right here so all the middle ones cancel out so there's a telescoping series so let's go with a theorem now If summation AN converges, then AN has to approach zero. Have I started using lazy limit notation yet? I think I probably did a while ago. So when I write AN arrow zero, what that really means That's really a limit. Lim n approaches in 
infinity of an equals zero. Uh, before, I think in calc one, I would do this, but below it, I would also write uh, as n approaches infinity, but so many of our uh, n's are going to be approaching infinity now. In chapter 10, pretty much every limit we take is going to be approaching infinity. That there may be some times where I'm just lazy and just write arrow zero, or whatever the limit actually is. So what this theorem says, if we have a convergent series, then the terms have to get very small. Why does that make sense? Well, if your terms are not going to get small, how can you add up and get a, a finite number? So if your terms uh, never get smaller than, let's say, 1, you would add them up and get infinity. Well, what if your terms never got smaller than even a small number like 1, 1 millionth? Well, you add up enough of those, and you'll have a huge number. You add up an infinite number of those, you'll have an infinite number. So this, uh, if the series converges, then the terms get small. So this is not a theorem, and this is actually false. So do not use this right here. This, what I'm about to write, is false. So if the terms approach 0, then you don't know anything about the series. So I'm going to write something false. So this is called the converse of the theorem. And the converse is not the same thing. So this says, if the terms get small, then a n converges. This is not true. This is absolutely false right here. So make sure you cross that out. That is false. What can I say if a n approaches 0? Then I know nothing about convergence. So if your terms get small, you don't know anything. You need to do a, a more work to see if it actually the series converges. So there is a contrapositive. So we crossed out what was false. So we have a contrapositive called the nth term test for divergence. So the nth term test, if a n does not approach 0, then the series diverges. So this is called the contrapositive. You turn around the if-then part, so the hypothesis becomes a conclusion, but you also have to negate both of them. So if the conclusion is not happening, then the uh, original hypothesis has to not be happening. And if you think, uh, the example I always use, if I get food poisoning, then I vomit. What happens if you know I didn't vomit for the last year? I did not get food poisoning. So that's a contrapositive. But if you know I didn't get food poisoning, you can't tell me anything. There's lots of other things that could cause vomiting. So uh, just because there was uh, no food poisoning, you can't actually use that theorem to say anything about uh, what happened. So the nth term test is generally going to be the useful one. So I would not bother with the original theorem. This is the, this is the useful version. Logically, they're equivalent. But I would just put the nth 
term test on your actual formula page. So unfortunately, all you can do with the nth term test for divergence is prove divergence. If it converges, this will be useless. So we're going to prove divergence here. The questions I'm going to ask you on your quiz and your homeworks and your final exam, I'm not going to tell you to prove divergence. I will ask you, does this converge, does this, does this diverge, and why? So you will have to decide which of the two is happening and then tell me why. So these examples are not like your other ones because I'm telling you these are going to diverge. So prove divergence. Uh, the first one, summation uh, n equals 1 to infinity, negative 1 to the n power. So let's use the nth term test. So this one, I told you it diverges, but we need to say why. So we use the nth term test, we just take the limit of the nth term. What is the limit of negative 1 to the n power? So when n is 1, it's negative 1. When n is 2, it's positive 1. And then negative 1, positive 1, negative 1, positive 1, negative 1, positive 1. So it gets close to 1 and negative 1, but it, unfortunately, no matter how far out you go, it's also going to be far away from negative 1. So it's neither negative 1 or positive 1 because it goes back and forth. So I would write D N E does not exist. If you graph it out, it's pretty easy to graph. Just going to look something like this right here. Just keeps going positive one, negative one, positive one, negative one, positive one, negative one. So never gets any closer to positive one because you're always going to have these negative one values. And it never gets close to positive 1, because no matter how far out you go, you're going to keep seeing negative 1 values. So it never settles down. All right. That means that the limit's definitely not 0, which is what we needed for, uh, if it's not 0, we can say it diverges. So you could write DNE is not equal to 0. Uh, so the limit is not 0, so it has to diverge. So it's a little silly to say DNE is not 0. So let's just say lim negative 1 to the n as n approaches infinity is not 0. So by the nth term test, the summation negative 1 to the n diverges. Any questions on proving this one? So I'm going to not make a very big deal about where these series start when we go for convergence or divergence. Does it matter that this started at 1 for anything that I did in this problem? That n was equal to 1 was the starting value. Nope, I could have started at 10. Could have started at negative 10. Any number I wanted to. It would be totally fine. So the starting value, when you're looking for convergence, your starting value is not very important. It's what happens when n is really big. So you, you can think of them as starting at a million or a billion, because that's really where you, before that, convergence never happens. Like convergence is a property of when n is approaching infinity, not a property of n being one or two or three or any finite value. So next problem, this one will diverge also. So prove divergence. So use the nth term test and prove divergence. So I want you to do this right now.
So you should have got your limit as one. Probably use L'Hopital's rule. You're taking a k derivative this time, not an x derivative, because k is our variable here. And we get this divergence. Now I did just say it doesn't matter where k starts. On something like this, you do want to make sure you wouldn't be divided by zero. So negative one would be a bad starting value. But any value past negative one would be totally fine. So we have some uh, divergent properties. So if we know A, K is divergent, then the following are divergent. So C times AK would be divergent, even if C is a really small number. The only number that would make this convergent would be the number zero. So as long as C is not zero, multiplying a divergent series by any number is gonna still be divergent. Summation, oh that's an ugly sigma. I can do better. I need to write this as separate sums. So this is divergent even when BK is negative. AK. So even if term by term they would cancel out, this would still be divergent. And the reason why, you are not allowed to reorder terms unless you know your series converges. That's the only time that you can reorder terms. There's some, somewhere on, somewhere on the internet, there is a fake proof of how adding up an infinite number of, uh, there's an infinite series that they add up and get like negative one six or something like that. I don't know if anybody's seen that. But the reason that it looks like it should work is because they reorder their terms and then say, hey, look, in this order, it adds up to this number. I think they add up an infinite number of positive values and get a negative number, which doesn't make sense. And the way they do it is they reorder their terms, which you're not allowed to unless your series converges. So be careful about reordering terms. So there's only one more example problem I'm going to do, but it's just like the other ones I've done before, just a little bit tougher. It's just another geometric series. So your quiz will be 10-1 and 10-2 on Friday.